Let us pray. Father, speak to our hearts, convict us, bring us to the foot of the cross, and we pray that your grace will abound in our hearts, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we looked at Elijah, the Elijah message, and the three Elijahs of history. Today, we want to look a little bit more closely at Elijah himself, the literal Elijah and his life. So if you would go with me back to 1 Kings, 1 Kings, chapter 13. By the way, does everyone have a Bible? We're going to rely heavily upon our Bible. We, we need a we need a Bible up here. Can someone get a Bible back there? And I made a couple of Bibles up here, I believe. Anyone, anyone need a Bible? Raise your hand. So right, right up here. Thank you. Very good. First Kings chapter 13. We're going to read a little bit of what we read last week. But we're going to talk a little bit more detail about some of the items. First Kings chapter 13, uh, 16, beginning in verse 30. Get a picture of what's happening here. First Kings chapter 16 and verse 30. Are we, did I say that correctly? Uh, I'm sorry, 16 is the chapter. <laughs> First Kings, chapter 16, and verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. He had quite a reputation, didn't he? So here he is, he's king of Israel, these are God's people now. This is the church of the Old Testament. And the leader marries Jezebel, a pagan, and falls into deep apostasy. What do you think the rest of the nation is going to do? They're probably going to follow many of them along with it. Go over to, just keep your finger right here because we're going to come back. But go over to first, uh, chapter 21, 1 Kings 21. And we'll get another couple of verses here that describe the situation. 1 Kings 21, verse 25. 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. So you see who's really, who's causing some, a lot of this trouble here, right? Uh, I mean, Ahab was to blame, of course, but his wife is stirring it up. Jezebel, Jezebel the pagan, who he had no business marrying. She remained a pagan. And she, wow, so this is, this is the situation. Verse 26, and he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Okay, well, let's go back to where we were, 1 Kings chapter 17 this time. So we're going to go to a new chapter, 1 Kings chapter 17. What is God going to do about this situation among his people? 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, let's see what happens next. So here, get the picture. 
God told Elijah to go down and walk right into the throne room of the king of Israel and give him a message. Now, do you think Elijah was thinking, oh, this will be no problem. I'll just walk right in there and tell him this. No, this is a message that he was risking his very life by going in and doing this. So he walks in. Somehow he gets right in there past the guards. And he's standing in front of Ahab, and he has a message for Ahab. And the message is, God is going to send a famine on this land for several years until God uh, changes that position, that situation. All right, so then uh, he walks out, and in verse 2, chapter 17 and verse 2, what happens next? The word of the Lord came unto Elijah, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan, and the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. Well, that's, God is taking care of his faithful servant, isn't he? Right there in this hideout in the brook, the brook Cherith. So God sends a famine on the land because of their apostasy, and God is taking care of his faithful servant Elijah. And uh, we, it doesn't tell us how long this took place, but we, last week, you remember, we went over to the New Testament over in James. We're not going to do that today, but in James, it tells us how long it was. It was three years. How, how long was it? Three years and? Three years. That's right. Three and a half years. This time lasted of, of the famine. Three and a half years. All right. Well, let's go to verse 7. The next verse in 17 there. Chapter 17, verse 7. What happens next? And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. So he's asking for food. He's been on a long journey. And he needs some food and water. And so... Well, what does she, how does she respond? Verse 12. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that way we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me. And after that, make it for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Now imagine yourself. Put yourself in this woman's place. She's on her last meal. She has just a little bit of, of, of grain there, meal, and, and, and just a little bit of oil. And she is going to gather some sticks and cook her last meal for herself and her son. And along comes this stranger and the stranger asks her for some water. And so she was going to get that. Okay. But then he asked her for some food. And she explains her situation to him. And he says, okay, bring me food first. And then God will take care of 
your food too. Now, was, what, was, what would you have done in that situation? This was a real test of faith, wasn't it? Are we, is, is she going to trust God for this stranger and provide for him? But she did the right thing, didn't she? And God rewarded her richly for her faithfulness, her generosity, and her hospitality. Those are all important things, aren't they? Well, let's go, let's skip down to chapter, the next chapter. We have some interesting things to get to here. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 1. Time passes by. The famine is, is growing, it is really uh, affecting the land. Verse, chapter 18, verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Now, what do you think Elijah, do you think Elijah would want to go visit Ahab at this point? No, because Ahab was looking all over the place and had sent out his soldiers looking for a Elijah. Because Elijah is the one who came in and announced this whole problem three and, a half year, three and a half years earlier. And so Ahab is saying, I've got to get that man. I'm going to take care of him. So Elijah would be tempted to not go. But Elijah was a faithful, obedient servant of God. And so he went. And so when, when Elijah and Ahab cross paths, let's go down to verse 17. Verse 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Now let's pause here for a moment. Isn't it interesting that those who are doing wrong and leading others in doing wrong blame the ones who are being faithful to God. They blame their troubles on someone else instead of taking the blame upon themselves as they should. And so they accuse God's people of being troublemakers. So how did Elijah respond? Did he agree? Did he apologize? No. Here's what Elijah said in verse 18. He spoke truth to power. Verse 18, And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. And here, now, verse 19, he says, Here's what we're going to do. Now therefore send, and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. So how did the people respond? And the people answered him not a word. It was silence. So here we are. Elijah has called the people together. And Ahab really had no choice but to comply. And so he calls all the people together, including the false prophets. 850 of them total. And there's going to be a showdown here on Mount Carmel. And Elijah asked them the question, how long are you going to fail to make a decision? How long are you going to try to decide whether God is right or God is not right and these other gods are the true God? And the people don't respond. They are silent. So have you ever stood alone when others 
are mocking God or perhaps cursing or telling indecent stories or perhaps you're in a group and some they're mistreating someone or perhaps they're just gossiping about someone making fun of them have you ever been tempted to remain silent when the honor of God is at stake or perhaps you were among a group of your friends and they were bullying someone mistreating them Elijah stood there alone, didn't he? Apparently. No one else was speaking up. And there he was, arrayed against him were 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of the grove, false teachers, apostates. And there was the top leader, the king, Ahab. Now he was supposed to be leading them towards God, wasn't he? But instead, he was a coward. He was motivated by greed and selfish ambition. And he was beholden to his pagan wife, Jezebel. And then there was the silent majority, the people of Israel. And they refused to speak up or to take a stand. And so there stood Elijah called of God to bring this stubborn, rebellious nation back to God, what was he going to do? Well, he had a plan. I'm sure God had shared that plan with him. And we pick it up in verse 22, chapter 18, verse 22. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them, therefore, give us two bullocks or two lamp, two uh, animals there, and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God." And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. That's a good plan. Okay, we'll do that. Verse 25, And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourself and dress it, for you are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. So verse 26, They took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. For there, but there was no voice, nor any that answered. So what did they do next? They leaped upon the altar which was made. I guess they had their own mosh pit there. And they, they were uh, kind of having a, a rock concert or something. And uh, they were leaping and jumping up and down and shouting and calling out to their god, Baal. And uh, what, was it, what was his response? What was, how was Baal responding? He wasn't saying anything. He was silent. So it came to pass, so at verse 27, at noon, Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping and must be wakened up. So they cried, aloud, they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. You've heard of people who cut themselves. It's a tragic thing. But that's not something of God, is it? And here we see it there in this pagan idolatrous practice. They would cut themselves with knives and lancets. They were drawing blood. They thought they had to appease their God and arouse his attention some way. Verse 29, And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that would be about 3 p.m., that there was neither voice nor any answer nor anything that regarded. Do you think they were starting to get a little bit embarrassed, these prophets of Baal? 
You know, they had tricked the people into believing that Baal was the true God. Now, if, what do you think they would have done? If they had gotten the chance, do you think they would have found a way to light, surreptitiously light that sacrifice and put some fire into there? Absolutely. But Elijah was watching them vigilantly. And that they could not do it. They couldn't get away with it. So finally, after sing, singing and dancing for most of the day, they were about ready to throw in the towel. And now it was time for Elijah to act. Verse 30. Verse 30. Pick up the story. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. You know, sometimes that's our job, isn't it? The altar of the Lord, symbol for worshiping God and obeying him. Sometimes it gets broken down in this world. It for sure gets broken down in this world. Sometimes it gets broken down in our homes, in our own lives, because we are not consistently worshiping God. And sometimes we need to repair the altar. So here's what Elijah did. Verse 31, he took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. What's that trench for? Well, let's see. Verse 33, and he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid them on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels of water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Wow. So he's making it hard on God, isn't he? He's making it hard on himself. <laughs> All right. He didn't do it just one time. Verse 34, he said, do it the second time. And so they did. And he said, do it the third time. And they did. Verse 35. And the water ran round about the altar and filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, listen to this prayer, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Wow, what a prayer. What a prayer. Simple, short, straightforward, from the heart. None of the other, none of the dancing and, you know, jumping up and down and on the altar and cutting themselves and screaming and hollering and all the rest that the, that the pagans were doing. Just a simple, beautiful, heartfelt prayer. How did God respond? Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. So the people had finally had their eyes opened. They saw that they had been deceived by the false prophets and they had strayed from God's truth. So what should be done now with the false prophets that had led the nation into idolatry and ruin? You know, they were guilty of treason against God and the nation. Well, we read about it in verse 40. Verse 40 and Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Sometimes the work of reform involves the unpleasant task of dealing with things in a decided way. Under God's direction, of course, this was a theocracy. We would not do this today, literally. But sometimes we have to slay the, the enemies of God spiritually with the sword of the word. And 
that is something that we do under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, now what happens? Verse 41, and Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Now, if you, we'll see here in a moment that Elijah said this in faith because was there any, were there any clouds in the sky at that point? No, it was clear sky. And there was no sound of rain coming. So he spoke this by faith. He trusted God because God had said he was going to send rain after all this occurred. Well, here, here uh, he tells Ahab, prepare yourself. You know, eat your food, drink, so forth, and get down off of Mount Carmel. You've got to get back to back home because the rain is coming. Verse 42, so Ahab went up to eat and drink. And Elijah, what did Elijah do? He went up to the top of Carmel and he cast himself down upon the earth and he put his face between his knees. He prayed. And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. That's the Mediterranean Sea, which the Mount Carmel's right on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea there. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And so Elijah said, go again. He did this seven times. He repeated this. So Elijah would pray, and then he would send his servant out over to the edge of the mountain, look out over the Mediterranean Sea. Do you see anything? Do you see any clouds coming? No. Three, four, five, six times. Nothing. Do you think it would be tempting for him to start questioning God and say, what? Lord, you promised what's happening. But the seventh time, his persistence and his faith paid off. Verse 44, And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And verse 46, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now, Jezreel is a, is, was the, where uh, Ahab's palace was located, and Jezreel was across the valley of Megiddo from Mount Carmel. So Mount Carmel is over here next to the Mediterranean Sea. There's the big, long valley of Megiddo. And then there's Jezreel, kind of straight off to the east there. It's approximately 20 miles, perhaps. There's different uh, variations on how, how long that was, but because Mount Carmel is kind of a long mountain there. But uh, so, uh, you know, Elijah is running ahead in the dark, in the rain, in the thunderstorm, and whatever was going on here, this heavy, this really heavy rainstorm, he is guiding uh, the king of Israel back home, running ahead of him, running ahead of the horses. God must have given him lots of strength to do that. <laughs> All right, so now think about this. Elijah was not too proud to run ahead of the king and guide the king. Now, this king had been an apostasy. This king was leading the people into sin. And yet, this king was no friend of Elijah. And yet, Elijah respects the position of the, of the leadership of God's people so much that he's, he says, I, I, he will go ahead of him and, and lead the way through the rain. Despite the king's rebellion, God still loved King Ahab and wanted to bring him to repentance. All right, let's go to the next chapter. Chapter 19, verse 1. Some interesting things happen here. Chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Ahab, apparently Jezebel was not there. She stayed back at the palace. 
And so Ahab comes back from this wonderful and glorious day where God has the victory. And he tells Jezebel all about it. Now, I don't know what Ahab's motives were, what he was thinking. If perhaps maybe he might be thinking, maybe I can change her mind. Maybe she'll see some light in this now after all. I don't know. Maybe he did. Maybe not. We don't know for sure. But what was Jezebel's response? Verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them, that's one of those prophets he killed, by tomorrow about this time. That was a threat, wasn't it? That was a serious threat. And do you think Jezebel could carry out that threat? Yeah, she, yeah, I mean, apart from God intervening? Yes, yeah, she was powerful and she was wicked and she got her way when she wanted to. And Ahab said, yes, ma'am, most of the time, apparently. So uh, this, was, this was a dangerous woman. So what did Elijah do? Verse 3. And when he saw this, when Elijah heard this, he arose. And he went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Poor Elijah. What happened? He had been so powerfully blessed by God earlier that day. He had seen the miraculous power of God. He had stood up in front of the king and 850 false prophets and in front of the entire nation. And he had exercised such incredible faith. God had protected him and preserved him going all the way back to the brook Cherith and earlier, I'm sure, as well. And then with the widow of Zarephath, he even raised her son to, from the dead. We didn't cover that part of the story. And he provided them with food and water all that time for those three and a half years of, of the famine, protecting him from the revenge of Ahab and Jezebel. But now, something is different. It really gets to Elijah this time. You know, Elijah must have been exhausted. After doing all this, remaining vigilant up there, while the 400, 850 false prophets are dancing and trying to light that fire probably he had to watch them very carefully and then you know through all of that and then running back running back in front of Ahab those 20 or so miles back to Jezreel in that storm he must have been exhausted he is completely discouraged why because just think about it. Put yourself in Elijah's place. He, I'm sure, expected that after all such a powerful display by God, God's power there on Mount Carmel, that Jezebel's power would be ended. That Ahab would change. That the people would make immediate and decided changes towards reformation and repentance. Wouldn't you expect that? And he probably expected that God would take matters into his own hands now and completely turn things around right there, right away. But what happens instead? For all of Elijah's troubles and sacrifice, for all the efforts he put forth, for all the risks to his personal safety that he undertook, this is his thanks. This is the result. That wicked, idolatrous woman is still in control of God's people. 
And she is threatening his life now. So Elijah is bewildered. He just can't believe it. So in fear and panic, he flees for his life. He has to get out of this place. He has to get away from people. And so he flees into the wilderness. Has God forsaken him? Has God forsaken his people? Now I'll give you a little cl a hint, clue here. Uh, you know this already probably. But if Elijah had not panicked and run, what do you think would have happened? Do you think that Jezebel would have been able to destroy Elijah? No. If he had remained there and remained faithful, God would have worked miraculously and probably would have turned the entire thing around uh, in a very short time. It, now, that happened later. Jezebel suffered. You know, she was eaten by dogs. And that was all decreed by God later. But that took quite a while later for all that to happen. And so, because Elijah was, was not able to hang on there at that very critical moment, uh, it, it had to be delayed. But God was merciful, wasn't he? And we, sh we shouldn't be too hard on Elijah. How often have we done that? Verse, let's go to uh, verse 5. Verse, chapter 19, verse 5. What does God do? And so Elijah is there. He's sleeping under the juniper tree. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake of bread, bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. So he went back to sleep. He was so tired, exhausted. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him. And said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. So he did. Verse 8, And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat or food forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Of course, that would be Mount Sinai, another name for Horeb. <clears throat> that food, you know, must have been... <laughs> That, mu that food must have been from heaven. Well, an angel cooked it, so I would have, it must have been a good meal. You know, that, that food took him all the way to Mount Sinai, a journey of 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I went on to Google Maps, and I mapped it out from Jezreel to Mount Sinai. Uh, if you were to drive it today, it would be approximately just under 400 miles. 382 miles. And so 40 days and 40 nights, roughly speaking, how many, how many, you mathematicians, how many miles is that per day? 10, about 10 miles per day. So Elijah traveled about 10 miles per day. Now, you remember, he's walking on foot. So that's, that's not too bad. Forty days and forty nights he traveled. Now, forty is a significant number, you know, in the Bible. Numbers have symbols sometimes in the Bible. And you see that number forty crops up many, many times in the Bible. And I'll just give you a few examples here. But, you know, it symbolizes a period of testing, of trial, of probation. You know, Moses lived for 40 years in Egypt, didn't he? And then he lived 40 years in the desert uh, before, he, before he delivered Israel, that is. And then after Israel was delivered from slavery, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So Moses had 40, 40, 40, three 40s. Moses was up in Mount Sinai receiving the law from God 40 days and 40 nights. You can read about that in Exodus. Moses sent the spies into the land of Canaan to spy out the land, and they were gone for 40 days and 40 nights. 
the prophet Jonah warned Nineveh for 40 days. In 40 days, God will destroy Nineveh. And how long did Jesus fast in the wilderness of temptation? 40 days. And in Noah's day, God rained water on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Many, many other times, 40 appears. So this is a significant number. Well, what happened to Elijah when he got to Mount Sinai? Verse 9, we're chapter 19, verse 9. And Elijah came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Has God ever asked you that question? What are you doing here? Who sent you to this place? Sometimes we are like Elijah. We run when God has not bidden us to run. We leave the scene of the battle when the going gets rough. We get discouraged or we get distracted by the things of this world, the cares of this life, from the mission that he has given to us. So God asks him a question. What doest thou here, Elijah? And verse 10, how does Elijah respond? Verse 10, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And so God answered back, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. You know, we often expect that God will exhibit mighty manifestations of, of divine power. We want something impressive to, to the senses. We want powerful, eloquent, and strong sermons, convicting logic that no one can gainsay. Or we want to see mighty miracles that prove God is working. But God does not often work that way. Instead, he speaks with a still, small voice. A whisper that gently tugs at our conscience. And it's effective. It works. God knows what he is doing. So like Elijah, we sometimes need to give up our self-pity, our sulky, bad tempers. We need to have our spirit softened and subdued. We need to learn to have a quiet trust, a firm reliance on God, that he will be an ever-present help in time of need. Well, let's look. Verse 13, let's see what happens here. Verse 13, And it was so, when Elijah heard, that it, heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and went out, and stood in the entering in of the cave, and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And so he answered the same thing again. He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because of the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. How does God respond? Verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint 
Haziel, to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abimelech, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room, in thy place. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Powerful. So God sent Elijah back to where he had come from. Elijah was now prepared to complete his assigned mission. It's interesting that God chose three leaders to execute judgment and to bring revival and reformation among his people. Hazel, king of Syria, was an outsider. He was a non-believer. But he would play a part in executing God's judgment on Israel. Jehu was of the people of God and would execute judgment and bring about reformation from the inside. And lastly, Elisha would be a spiritual leader among God's people. Do we see the same thing operating today and how God deals with his church, with his people? God uses those outside the church to exert pressure on his people. To arouse them from their slumbers. He uses zealous people within the church to help us come into line. And he uses spiritual leaders within the church, like Elisha. Now, as an aside, Jehu, and there's you can read we can you know read about that later on. We're not going to do it today. That's a separate study. But Jehu is an interesting fellow. God used him to do the work of the Lord, but often he took matters too far. He was very zealous. And, uh, and sometimes he would, he would do things in a, in a manner that was really not after God's way of doing things. But uh, sometimes you can, read, you can read about that story a little later in the, in the chapters to follow. But that is a separate study. Nevertheless, God used him. So what does it mean when it says, that last part there, verse 17, that him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay? Is God going to send his prophet Elisha to kill people with a sword? Well, Haziel and Jehu killed people with a literal sword, but Elisha did so with the sword of the word, the word of God. And if you read, and we won't turn there, but in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 5, it says this, God speaking, I hewed them, meaning I cut and hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And in Jeremiah, it says, See, I have, set this day, I, have set, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down. Speaking to Jeremiah, the prophet. And of course, we remember that verse over in Hebrews 4, verse 12, where it talks about the word of God, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So in this sense, it's a spiritual warfare, isn't it? So Elisha would slay people by the word of the Lord. And sure enough, he did in so many ways. And we notice there in verse 18 that how many people were left in Israel that God said? 7,000. They were not bowing down to Baal or kissing him. So, you know, God has his faithful people scattered among his church. 
And today, when we look at the situation in our world, when we look at the terrible condition of the Christian church at large, and closer to home when we view our own church, both locally here and around the world, and we notice the flaws and the shortcomings and the faults and even apostasy and even among our leaders, should we give in to the the temptation to give up, to declare that it is hopeless, that the church has gone too far and is beyond redemption? We can learn from Elijah's story. God has his faithful few, the 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Well, let's pick up the remainder of the story here. In verse 19, chapter 19, verse 19, what did Elijah do? God gave him the commission. Now what does he do? So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th, the 12th, there were different teams, probably two in each team. And so Elisha is actually on the 12th one. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. So this shows the fact that there are 12 yoke of oxen. This shows that this was, this was a wealthy family, and they were farmers, and they were tilling the land. And Elisha was out there working diligently, plowing the field. But Elijah comes, comes along. And Elijah, in passing by the field, he goes over to him and he puts his mantle, his, his outer coat, on his shoulders of Elisha. Now that was a signal, wasn't it? That was a signal. That was very significant. That meant that he was passing, you've heard the term passing the mantle? It'd be like passing the baton in, in a uh, somewhat similar way. He is passing the, his responsibility now over to this new person, Elisha. Elisha is now going to take over Elijah's responsibilities. That was the signal, but he didn't say, t- say anything to him right there. And so what happened? Verse 20. And so Elisha left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And Elijah said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? So Elisha is there, and he has, he recognizes this is significant. He knows, he knows about Elijah. He, they, they've known about Elijah, of course. And he knew this is a call from God. And he just goes to Elijah and says, Look, I'll, I'll go with you, but let me go back to my family and say goodbye and, and you know, tidy up that, the loose, any loose ends there, and then I'll come and I'll follow you. And Elijah, Elijah responded, Go ahead and do that, but... Really, what, what have I done? Uh, in other words, think about what that calling you have been given and count the costs and make sure you are committed before you come and follow me. And so what did he do? Verse 21, Elisha, this is what Elisha did. And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen. And gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. So notice what he does here. He takes a yoke of oxen, and he slew them. And then he prepared the, the, the meat there for food for the servants and family and so forth. And he, what did he use to build the fire with? The instruments of the oxen, in other words, the yoke and the various paraphernalia that would that would uh, hold that team together. So, what does that tell us there? What is the significance of that? Have you heard the term "burning your bridges behind you"? 
Elisha was saying, I am going, I am making a full commitment here. I am turning my back on my past life, and I am fully committed to following God and his calling. I am going to take these instruments, these, the, the harness, the, the yoke, the, the wooden yoke that fit over the team. I'm going to take that that I used to help me accomplish this farming. I'm going to burn it and cook this yoke of uh, this oxen. I can't, he can't use that anymore, can he? That's a total commitment, isn't it? Once he made the decision to serve God full-time in this new mission, there was no turning back. And so Elisha went on to say, serve Elijah faithfully for the remainder of Elijah's time on this earth, which wasn't terribly long. And you know, it must have been a humbling experience to do that. Here he was serving the, the prophet. And, but eventually he took over Elijah's ministry. And he went on to do great exploits for God. That's a beautiful, wonderful story in its own right. But uh, Elisha, of course, did many wonderful things in his, in his life. Work, worked miracles. Now, as for Elijah, what happened to Elijah? Well, there's several, we're going to skip over several chapters here because and some interesting things happened there during that time. But we're going to go over to what we talked about last week. And this is Second Kings. Go over to Second Kings, the next book over, Second Kings, chapter two and verse one. Elisha and Elijah are together. They've been ministering together. Elisha has been men mentoring under Elijah, training to take his place, to bring about the the, the Reformation, the revival and Reformation that Elijah start, began. Elisha is going to complete that task. But as for Elijah, what's going to happen to him? Chapter 2 of 2 Kings, verse 1. And it came to pass, when the Lord would take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And we'll skip over down to verse 11. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire that, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So here we see Elijah, this man who James says was a man of like passions like we are. This man who was subject to discouragement to feelings of despondency, of despair. Here he is. God takes him and translates him without seeing death. Elijah never died. And he, he, we went up into heaven. And of course we see him there on the Mount of Transfiguration in, math, in uh, the New Testament. Jesus standing on the Mount of Trans Transfiguration you remember the story just before the crucifixion? And who's standing there with him? Moses and Elijah. Moses representing those who die first and then are resurrected. That's what happened to Moses, according to Jude. And Elijah, who was translated without seeing death. The two major classes of people who will be saved. They're there consulting with Jesus Helping Jesus prepare for the, for the cross. Beautiful. Significant. Elijah. What a privilege. What a story. The life of Elijah provides us with so many lessons of how God deals with us. We see God's tender mercy. His watch care. His attention to the details of our lives. We see also that God is a God of justice and judgment, a holy God that will not ignore evil. He will punish evildoers, but on his own time and in his own way. And God will reward those who are faithful and loyal to him. 
This is a challenge to you and me today. For us to be loyal and faithful like Elijah, as he stood alone for truth and for God, let us not grow weary or discouraged in our work of revival and reformation in our own lives, among our families, in our church, and in the world. Like Elijah, let us take courage and be filled with hope as we contemplate the glorious future that awaits those who hold on to God by faith.